The passage that uh, most of the churches will be using this morning is the 1 John, the second chapter. And let me read uh, uh, this passage of Scripture and then make some comments. Uh, 1 John, chapter 2, verse 3, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now by this we know that we know Him. And, and if I was going to choose a topic today, I guess... That would be my topic. How do you know? How do you know? Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked, meaning how Jesus walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. And I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Little children... It is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know these things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He has promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as that same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie... And just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. I love the Apostle John. Ever since I began to read the Gospel of John and teach it to some young people in a Bible school setting, I have really appreciated the depth and the, the insight and the poetic way I 
as I look at it, that John approaches the throne of grace and interprets our Lord and Master to us. As you probably know, John lived a long time with the Holy Spirit abiding in him before he wrote. Uh, some say it was maybe 70 years before he wrote uh, these epistles and certainly the book of Revelation, one of the later things that he wrote. But here's a man who not only walked with Jesus, but walked in the Spirit for a good many years. And so when he began to write, a lot of the things that he interpreted to us are just a bit different uh, from what the other three Gospels interpret for us. And I've learned to appreciate that. I, I think that uh, uh, when the, the picture of John leaning on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper, um, hearing the heartbeat of Jesus perhaps, <laughs> I think that was one of the stabilizing things in his mind when he, on the Isle of Patmos he began to witness weird and beautiful things that he didn't know what to do with it. And then finally he heard the thump, thump, thump of the master's heart. And the master said, write down what you see, John. Write down what you hear. And hence we have the, the book of Revelation. So that's kind of my, my view of John and his, his work among us. And he, and he says things in such a neat manner that it, it kind of sticks with me really well. And I guess many times unknowingly just quote things that John said because I love what he says. Now, I think this chapter uh, really begins back up in the other chapter in uh, verse 8 where it says, uh, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. So one of the ways that we can know we are of Him and abide in Him is whether we confess our sins or cover our sins. The natural tendency is to cover our sins. Somebody accuses me and I want to make a defense. I want to, um, you know, make an excuse for myself. I want to interpret it through my eyes and not through the eyes of the accuser. So our tendency is, when we sin, is to cover it if we're confronted rather than confess it. I don't know about you, but I learned that quite young. I mean, uh, mother or dad would say, did you or didn't you? And, and you know, sometimes we tell them part of the truth but not all the truth because if we knew, if we told them all the truth, we'd be in trouble. And so we learn to do this quite young, to cover our sins rather than confess our sins. But you know, the, the beauty of confession is that then you're free, the weight's off your back. Uh, people see you as you are, not as you think you, you ought to be seen. And that's one of the reasons we cover our mistakes, we cover our sins. See, that's one reason I wear a shirt like this, because of this belly. I, I, <laughs> I'm covering my sin. I learned that from some of my friends, that that's the thing to do. You know? So therefore I stand before you as an example of one who covers. We don't have to go very far in the Bible to realize that there were some other people who understood this principle. I love Psalm 51 because David <clears throat> in this psalm talks about his sin. And, and I've used it so many times in talking with people, sharing with people. Um, he says in Psalm 51, 5, Look, God, <laughs> I was guilty of sin from my birth, a sinner the moment my mother conceived me. Now, now that's, a, that's an awesome concept, you know. I was guilty of sin from birth, a sinner the moment my mother conceived me. I, I don't know how old I was before I really fully understood that. But, uh, you know, up to that point, I continually made excuses for the innocent ones. The, you know, the little ones, how can the little one be sinful? Well, they are sinful because the Bible says they are sinful, not because of what they do or don't do. And, and he even takes it back to conception. <clears throat> 
a sinner the moment my mother conceived me. He says, look, God, you desire integrity in the inner man. You want me to possess wisdom. So he says, sprinkle me with water and I will be pure. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Grant me the ultimate joy of being forgiven. Now, to me, that's one of the beautiful things about forgiveness, is that you have the ultimate joy of being forgiven. When you ask God to forgive you, you're forgiven. Amen? And you have to receive that forgiveness. And then you walk in the ultimate joy of being forgiven. You know, our judicial system is kind of screwy when it comes to thinking biblically. If you go before a court and you've been accused of a crime, your defense lawyer takes you before the judge and says, plead not guilty. But what if you're guilty? What, what does that do to the spiritual dynamics within us when I go before the judge and I know I did that deed, but I have to say to the judge, not guilty? Does that man ever get free? You know, what does that do to the person who is basically lying about covering over his sins? Does he ever get free? Well, we would hope so. You know, I've read the story of many convicts that reading their Bible in, in the, sales, uh, the cell where they have to abide for many, many days. They come to know the living Jesus and confess their sins, and then they feel free. They may still be in a cell, but they're free. They know the joy of confession and forgiveness. Uh, I, I really appreciate John for this aspect, that he, he understands what it means to be a sinner standing before God and having God gaze upon my sin. It's, a, it's not a very pretty picture, is it? And yet John tells me how I can know my sins are forgiven. And the first step is if I confess. But if I say I have no sin, I'm a liar and the truth is not in me. The second thing that he wants us to understand, <clears throat> I learned from Brother Ray, it's good to take a little water along because I haven't been in the pulpit for a while, and my mouth gets dry. The next thing he says, now this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now there's, uh, there's a lot of different commandments out there, the commandments of the Old Testament, the things that Jesus spoke and the Sermon on the Mount and so forth. But I really think that the commandments that John's talking about here are the commandments that I hear directly from the Lord through the Spirit. You know, God wants to guide our steps. And when He will send the Holy Spirit, and when He has come, He will abide in you, He will guide you, He will direct you, He will do all of those things. But do we access Him? Do we access the Holy Spirit? Do we ask God before we act? Uh, we have a tendency to act and then if we get into difficulty, then ask God. Wouldn't it be much better to ask God before we enter into anything and find out what He would wish for us to do? It seems to make good sense to me. And in our, in our lifetime, we found that when we stop and pray, we make better decisions. If we stop and pray and wait a little bit, because, you know, God isn't going to text you right back and say, this is what you do, Eldon. He makes me wait, and that's frustrating. But sometimes that waiting is when wisdom comes. So we found that if we wait on an answer from the Lord, wait a day, wait two, wait three days before we make an important decision or an important move, and then one of us will say to the other, what did you hear? And they will say such and such, and then the other one will say, what did you hear? It's amazing how many times we hear the same thing. It's amazing. God must have known what He was doing when He put us together. We, we don't always appreciate the other's viewpoint, but we, when we hear from God, we really appreciate it. We really appreciate it. The fact that she's hearing the same thing that I'm hearing. Glory to God. That's good. Things go better that way. So, obeying His commandments. 
It says, if I say that I know him, but do not keep his commandments, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know nothing reflects the light like love. You know, that's a phrase that came to me while I was preparing this. Nothing reflects the light like love. When we mix love in our relationships, uh, especially there are some who are hard to love, difficult to love. But if we pray about it and ask God, there's probably some way we can communicate. And maybe through that communication, some love will shine forth. Uh, we've met people in our lives that we just have difficulty with. They are just obstinate people in our eyes. And we probably appear to be obstinate people in their eyes. And then there's always this bang, bang, bang when you get together. Or when you hear something they said, you want to counter it with something cute or smart or sarcastic. There's always that conflict. Now, what can resolve that conflict? Well, uh, the Bible says love can resolve the conflict. Well, who's going to show the first speck of love in this relationship? Well, pray about it. God may burden you with the first step, you know, which would be beautiful. And, and I've experienced that. I've experienced it. Just said something to the person that uh, kind of off the cuff, uh, innocently, and the whole atmosphere changes. Now, it wasn't because of my wisdom. I think it was because that the Holy Spirit slipped in something that was loving and kind and allowed the relationship to open up again and to blossom. Nate talks about love for one another. He says, I write you no new commandment. Back in Leviticus 19, 18, it says, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he adds it with, I am the Lord. I, I, think, <laughs> I think God wanted to put a particular emphasis on that. He says, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So you better hear it, you know. Uh, so it's not a new commandment. It's written back to the children of Israel in the, in the wilderness, that you shall love, not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, because nothing reflects the light like love. Uh, over in John 4, 1 John 4, 21, uh, he also says this, the similar thing. He says, and this is the commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother. Must love his brother. Uh, we, we, we have an interesting concept of love sometimes. Uh, sometimes we think of love as accepting everything the other person says, uh, believing everything they say, and so forth. But sometimes people say things that you know are wrong. You just know they're wrong. But they're your friend. Now, what are you going to do with it? You'll love them anyway. You've got to try to reconcile the differences and find a statement you can both agree upon, or what are you going to do? The Bible says you've got to love them, not hate them. Uh, I had a teacher one time teaching a lot of our adults in one of our churches, and, and the adults really flocked to this teacher. Uh, the teaching was much better than what mine was, obviously, at that point in time, or they liked it better or whatever. And I was riding with that teacher one day in the car. We were going to a nursing home to visit somebody, and that teacher said this very, just right out loud, right in my ear, she says, I don't sin. And I thought for a little bit, uh, how can you respond to this? <laughs> so I asked her a question. What is it that you do? Well, we finally got down to the fact that she made mistakes. So it's, you know, playing with the language and so forth. But, but it was a big thing to say, I don't sin. Well, the Bible says you do sin. If you say you don't sin, you're a liar. <laughs> so how do you love somebody through all of that? And, and we have disagreements like that, you know, in the body of Christ. I hear some pretty serious disagreements sometimes in teaching pool. But that's one of the beauties of teaching pool. There's enough people there to kind of help you work around it and through it and so forth to, you know, acquire a little different viewpoint. Some don't change quickly, but 
most, most people change eventually if you've got peers around you saying one thing which is so different from what you're saying. You think somebody's wrong here and let's think it through and pray it through. So being together <clears throat> and practicing loving one another, uh, he says in verse 27, if the anointing abides, he is your teacher. If the anointing abides, you don't need a teacher. If the anointing abides, the Holy Spirit is my teacher in residence who will teach me what to do and what to say. And that's one of the beauties of, of understanding what the Holy Spirit is and does for you and for me. And, and you never graduate from his school. <laughs> you know, I'm in my late 70s. I'm not graduated from his school at all. Some days I think I'm just a beginner. Good grief. Why didn't I see that? Why didn't I hear that? Well, you probably did hear it, Eldon, but you overlooked it or you were distracted by things of the world. Are you distracted by things of the world? It says that that's our enemy. We'll get to that in a little bit here. But we, but we practice. Verse 29 says, but we practice... And if we know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness. So, so it's a practice that we're involved in, following the voice of the Holy Spirit, uh, allowing him to lead and guide and direct us. So we want to do and hear what the Spirit says, and nothing reflects like, like love. There's an interesting passage here in verse 12 through uh, 14, which is kind of written in poetic form. And as I read that, I, I felt I got a little bit of an insight into what John was saying here. He says, I write to you, little children, and then he mentions the fathers and the young men. And then he goes back and mentions the little children, the fathers, and the young men a second time. Um, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. If you think of a child as one who just learned to know who Jesus was, uh, that's childlike faith. You, you learn that you're a sinner. You know, we're, we learn that fairly young. You know, I've known children four, five, six, seven, you know, all the way through, that know, they know what sin is. They know that they are a sinner. But they don't know what to do with it. And if there's an adult there to teach them, they teach them, well, you ask your father to forgive your sins and he will forgive you your sins. And, and the beautiful thing is that when that child prays, whether you're five years old or 55 or 95, when that child prays, guess what? The burden goes. There, there's something happens internally. That's a first awareness that there is a heavenly being who cares about me. I just ask him, and he took away the burden. So, so we come to God and Jesus first as children. And so he's speaking to the little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. That's the first step in learning to be a believer. Then he says, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. And the second time he says the same thing. I have written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. Well, a father not only knows about forgiveness, but, but a father understands why forgiveness is important. And he can take you all the way back to the beginning, to the Garden of Eden, and carry you through the prophets and teach you all the things about forgiveness. So the fathers are important because you have known him who is from the beginning. And then he says, I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. And in the second place, I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. I don't know about your attitude when you were, you know, 18, 19. Um, you know, we begin to think, now I'm an adult, I can do what I want. You ever have that feeling? Now that I'm not living with my parents, I can do what I want. 
<clears throat> so we begin to test different things. And depending on our upbringing, you know, we may test a lot of things before we come to our senses. Because he says to this young man, he says, because you have overcome the wicked one. And guess what? At that stage in your life, the wicked one is there. He, he wants to take you here. He wants to take you there. That sounds like fun. Let's go there. And that's how young people are led into the world and captured by the, the, the wiles of the world, the sins of the world, and many times are overcome by those things and never retreat. Others go into that kind of thing and they begin to hear their father's teaching, the teachings of the Bible, a conviction comes upon them and they repent and then they restrain themselves. They overcome the things of the world. And, and if we're going to send somebody to war, who do we choose? The young people. So he says, you are strong. So it's, it's the young people who are, God is equipping to be the missionaries. To be, to be those who reach out to other people in the world who have never heard of Jesus Christ. And they go into all the world. They are strong. They have overcome. They're ready for the battle. And I like the way John places this. He says, uh, they have learned to overcome the lusts of the world, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. You know, from the time, just about the time we enter puberty, uh, all of these things begin to play on our minds, and it seems like it happens younger and younger since we have so much communication. I just heard this morning that about 50% uh, of eight-year-olds already have a cell phone. Think of what they'll learn. I don't know if you have any eight-year-olds that have cell phones yet or not, but I just read that on the Internet this morning, 50% of... Eight-year-olds have cell phones. Well, you know, the temptations of the world are so much more available than they were when I was growing up. You know, being born and raised on a farm and my main social life was church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. That was my main social life. And, and the young people there were under the same kind of restrictions I was, so we didn't have much opportunity to exp explore things with the friends at school who said they were doing all kinds of wonderful, interesting, fun things. And now I can thank God I never got to experiment with those things that they were experimenting with because some of them got in deep trouble. So we have to control our love for the world. No dual citizenship. You can't be a citizen of the world and a citizen of his kingdom. You can't be both. So what do you choose? Uh, one of, the ways, one of the ways I think that John has taught us here that if you see that the world is getting too much of your attention, uh, too much of your energy, to confess that to the Father. Father, what shall I do? Well, one of my favorite prayers lately has been, Lord, you knew I'd turn out this way. <laughs> so what do we do from here on? <laughs> I don't know what that does for me, but to me it just seems to be a good prayer to pray. And he did. He knew I would turn out this way. He knew I would be in this condition at this point in my life. He knew all of that. We haven't hidden anything from him. But, but I, I'm excited to know what he's going to do with the rest of my life. See, I am. I, I have prayed several times, and, and <clears throat> I haven't done it lately, maybe because I'm not really wanting to hear the answer again. But the answer I usually hear is this. At 78 years old, the answer I usually hear is this. The greater thing for which you were prepared has not yet been accomplished. And, and to be frank with me, the first time I heard that scared me to death. I thought, man, that means a lot of hard work, and I don't want to do any hard work anymore, you know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm up to it, Lord. But then I, I come to realize that it's not up to me. If the Holy Spirit spoke that, then he's the one that will bring it to pass. Uh, and then you think, what could that be? You know, what could that be? Uh, I can do this and I can do that, but it isn't what I can do, it's what he can do. So someday, 
I will be standing in the, the appropriate place, the appropriate time, with the appropriate people, and a lightning bolt will strike. And I'll do whatever I'm asked to do. See, I think that's the way it happens. But meanwhile, I try to be nice to people, <laughs> try to ex exert love toward people, be helpful to people, be kind to my neighbor, be neighborly. <laughs> my neighbor's a friend he's used that term a couple times. They said, why are you calling into the electric company for your neighbor? He says, did you ever hear of the word neighborly? <laughs> he called in to tell my electricity was off as well as his. Neighborly. But it says, if the anointing abides, he is our teacher forever. And then finally, we do practice righteousness. Everyone who practices righteousness. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we used, to, we used to qualify righteousness by, you know, you don't smoke, you don't chew, you don't go around around with people who do. All of those do's and don'ts of the Christian life. But, but really, righteousness is following what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Uh, Jesus defines it the best. He said, whatever I see him do, I do. Whatever I hear him do, I do. I only speak what I hear him say. I speak a lot of other things besides what I hear him say. But I wonder if we're going to practice righteousness, how appropriate are the things that I speak that are not of him? Do you ever think of that? Jesus said, I only speak what I hear the Father speak. I speak a lot of things. I know, I know the majority of them are not of him. But does that make me a sinner? Or does that make me one who is practicing learning to hear, learning to do? Well, I'd like to think it's a latter, but you can be the judge. Nothing reflects light like love. Now, who can love? Anybody can love. Anybody can help someone. Anybody can speak a word of encouragement. I used to be around an old doctor. He was a general practitioner through the Depression years. And, you know, everybody that came in had more burdens than just the physical ailment they had. But he said that uh, the greatest medicine he ever administered is they would walk out the door, he'd pat them on the shoulder and say, you're going to be all right. Just that word, you're going to be all right. And, and it's amazing to me how much a word of encouragement does to people. We can all do that, you know. We're not in competition with each other. We're all pilgrims on a journey. We need to understand that, you know. The, the day I understood that my father was a normal human being on a spiritual pilgrimage just like me, I could come alongside him and we could be friends in a new way. He was also a pilgrim on a journey. And all of you are pilgrims on a journey like I am. So we can be of help and encouragement to one another, to, to our pastors, to our leaders, to those who work among us, those who labor among us. We need to practice righteousness. We need to hear what God would say to me to say to you. And I'd hope that some of the things that I've said this morning are what I heard from the Father that I have spoken to you. And if you heard them from, from the Father, take them as from the Father and not from me. And, and hold them in your heart and let them grow there. You know, one of the beautiful things about Mary is when she heard the word of God, she believed it. You remember what the Bible says? She put those words in her heart. She held them in her heart several times. It says this about Mary. And when she held those words in her heart, guess what grew right under her heart? The little baby called Jesus grew right under her heart. She heard the word and hid it in her heart. And Jesus grew right there. I think we're in a similar we're in a similar state of reception if we will hear what the Father is speaking to us now. We may be headed into difficult times, I don't know. You know, this, this talks about the end. Here, little children, this is the last hour as you've heard. The Antichrist is coming and some of them are here already. Well, Antichrist is those who speak against Christ, who speak against his people. 
I've heard plenty of that in my lifetime. There's still those who speak against Christians and Christianity. They're all around us. They will be here. They will be here to the end. Uh, some people say we're in the last days. I, I think yes. I think the last days really began when uh, Jesus ascended into heaven. That was the beginning of the last days because all of these writers who wrote back there in the first century said the last days are here, last days are here. I believe they are. But now if you're talking about the last of the last days, I don't know about that and I don't think anybody knows much about that. But we think we know something about it. We think we can be prepared somewhat. Uh, the best advice I heard is always make your plans for 100 years but be prepared to go anytime. That's about the best advice I ever heard. In other words, don't stop planning. Don't stop like some of them did. Just, you know, put on white clothes and stand in the cave. Jesus is coming tomorrow. <laughs> didn't work. Hey, he didn't come. They had to find their clothes and go on with life again. <laughs> so we're in the last days, no doubt about it. We, but, but, uh, but we have an anointing from the Holy One, and He is to teach us all things. He says, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. So, when, when it comes down to questioning the faith that you have, your, your faith, I presume, is based on this book. It's based on this book. And, and what I've come to think about more than anything else, either I believe this word or I don't believe this word. And if this word says it, I believe it. Now, I can't always make it fit your theology, but I don't have to. This, this word took care of my forefathers for generations, and it took care of my generation, and it'll take care of the next generation. That's what I believe. So we have this anointing among us, and the word here is the thing that inspires that anointing, Probably 95% of the things that God is ever going to tell you is right in this book. And the other 5% you'll get while you're walking it out, you know. I found out more truth of God by trying things that didn't work. I understand a closed door. You just don't want to kick them open. Closed doors don't go through them. Pray, ask for an opening. Head for it, but if it closes, back off. <laughs> so I think I learned maybe more from the, the no, don't do that aspect than I have, yes, go do that aspect of God's Holy Spirit working in me. But I'm still longing for and looking for the yes of the Spirit every day. Where's God working today? He's out there somewhere. He's working. And you know what? If you can find out where He's working, you go get alongside It'll make you look good. You know that? Sometimes that's all you got to do. Just look where God's working and go join in and help. And it makes you look good, feel good. One time it was a, a lady coming out of the hospital and I was walking in. I said, oh, good, I saw you. I'm glad I saw you. And she said, and then she explained that there was a friend of hers in the hospital who was facing amputation. And they, they said her leg was infected and they were going to have to amputate. And she says, I, I don't believe God wants her leg taken away. Would you go and I told God if somebody would come that I could agree with and pray with, that I would go back and pray and we'd pray that that leg would be saved. So she explained that to me. I said, she said, would you go? I said, well, of course I'd go. Of course I'll go. If God's working in this, I want to be there, you know. Well, we prayed and God saved the leg, not because of my faith, but because that woman had heard something from God. She was willing to execute it, even to the point of maybe looking foolish. And I was the first turkey that came along that she thought <laughs> might be of help in this process. And so I said, yes, and we did, and he did. Yeah, yeah. Now, th there's incidents like that happening every day. Every day, everywhere, every day, everywhere. And, and just a little bit of love reflects a lot of light. Amen? Amen? Let's pray, and then would the musicians come and close us out. 
Father, I want to thank you for this day. Thank you for this congregation of people. I thank you for all that you have done through this church and the many people who have come here to learn and serve. And we look with anticipation in the future that you're going to bring something greater than we, any of us have ever expected to bear upon us and bring light and glory to your name. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Amen. And if after they're done singing, if anybody wants prayer, why come on up there are those who will pray with you. We're going to um, sing How Deep the Father's Love for Us and just reflect again on what his love is like and um, just respond to that love.
Father, we thank you for this day. And may your blessing of peace descend upon every one of us and fill us with joy unspeakable because we know that we are forgiven and that we are called to do something far beyond our ability or desire to do, but yet you are willing to lead us and guide us and direct us. Thank you, Father, for your love. May we extend that love to our brother and our sister as we walk through this week. In Jesus' name I pray. And all the people said amen.